Um, guys, you were fantastic in this movie, and I just want to know what it's like to walk on a set. It's all green screen. You don't know what the heck you're gonna, you know, what it's gonna envision. You know, wh how do you even go there when you're talking to Guillermo at, at first, and then you've got to make these characters come to life? Well, I, well, one of the amazing things is that almost nothing was green screen, which was fantastic. Uh, Guillermo reconstructed four city blocks of Hong Kong for some of these sequences, and I would walk into the set and I'm supposed to be running from these creatures. There's 500 extras and they're carrying chickens and there's dogs running in the streets and and the set is incredibly detailed and this monster's flipping cars over uh, as it moves and he's rigged these cars on springs that are actually flying over me. So um, I've been asked a lot, you know, what's it like just standing in front of a green screen? And I, I think maybe I saw a green screen once over the entire course of filming. So how amazing, you know, you, then to have the sets that you guys had and to work on I mean, you and him go back 20 years. You guys are, you know, symbiotic, I think, by now. His we're kids, drifting. His, yeah, you're drifting, right. And your drifting kids call together. you Uncle Ron. Luckily, we're not drifting apart. <laughs> no, not drifting apart. But what is it about this man? I mean, why is he so damn good at making these types of films? Well, he, he has a, an imagination that is, you know, in a class by itself. But he has this... Um, I don't know if you've ever been privy to his notebooks. He carries notebooks around with him and he fills them and then he just gets a brand new one. He's probably gotten hundreds of them filled by now. But if you look at his drawings, it's like looking through the drawings of Leonardo da Vinci because they're not only things that, are, that don't exist in reality, but by the time he's finished with them because of his engineering ability and his ability to realize these things as an artist, they do exist in reality. So he's the perfect fit for and some of these things that he draws that spring from his imagination make it into his movies. Some of them haven't so far, but may in the future. Mm -hmm. But this is what he does 24 hours a day. He's just got this unbelievable stuff coursing out of him. And so he's a gift to cinema because he's, he's so fertile. Well, you guys work hard, but do you ever feel like a slacker next to somebody like him? Yes. I, I yeah. do. Yeah. I do. He just is nonstop. And when does a guy even sleep? He doesn't sleep. I gotta sleep. Do you sleep? Yeah, I, I sleep. I gotta, I sleep, I gotta get I sleep, sleep a lot, man. I sleep <laughs> while I'm awake. It's important to do that. I, I, I feel like a total slacker next to Guillermo. We were doing Hellboy 2. Uh, he took a year to do pre-production, a year, uh, seven months to shoot, and a year to do post-production. And while he was a, about a month away from releasing the movie, he calls me up and he goes, Ron, I've just written this book. I want you to do the audio. It's called The Strain, right? Yeah. It's 800 pages, first volume, it's a, tr it's a trilogy. It arrives at my house, two guys have to carry this thing into my house, it's so heavy. I said, I've been with you the whole time making the biggest movie you've ever made in your life. When did you write this book? Well, I had diarrhea, I, you know, I, was, I was in the bathroom and I, I just wrote. Um, he didn't really say that. No, I, I know, but that, that was a good story though. <laughs> Unbelievable. I try to make it my own. And I love that. I love that about you. What, you know, for you, I, of course, you guys bring a bit of a comic relief to this film, but for you to be on a set like this, to be in a huge budget film like this, I'm sure your TV show probably doesn't even, you know, you probably do, what, eight seasons and then it wouldn't even cost as much as Pacific Rim probably. Yeah, doesn't. we're nine seasons deep and I think maybe we cost as much as, as the Jaeger's foot. It's amazing. So to be on something like this, but to have the opportunity to maybe improvise? Did you guys get to do that type of, did he give you that freedom? He actually did, which was uh, surprising. I, I didn't know that I necessarily even wanted it, but um, uh, there were times for it and there were times that uh, it didn't make sense to do it. I, I have a lot of technical jargon here and there, so <clears throat> you can't really sort of improvise about what's what these creatures are made of, but um, there were times where I'm reacting to uh, Ron here, or uh, or my lab partner Burn Gorman, and and we could be a little loose with it, but uh, which he doesn't discourage. Yeah, he's very collaborative, and he's yeah. very open to seeing things. You don't really want to improvise because what he what he's given you on the page is perfect, and but but he he's he's really very secure with what he's doing, so he, he's completely open. If Charlie comes up with just this genius thing in a rehearsal, man. All of a sudden, the scene will go that way. He'll just say, I'm changing my whole plan. That's fantastic. Your idea is better than mine. I don't know many guys that 
support that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, this film is about co-piloting and drifting and you have to meld mine. So in real life, who would be your co-pilot? Who would you want to drift with? Ron, do you want to start this time? This is this is your opportunity to redeem yourself here. Go for it. There's no redemption when it comes to me. <laughs> Who would I want to drift with? My my life partner, my wife. We've been drifting together for 37 years. Honey. Last time you said Groucho Marx. And so... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Just let me redeem myself. And then you... Threw me under the right same under the exact glass. bus you picked me up on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Charlie, your turn. I'm good. I'm two for two. I'm saying my wife again. <laughs> I'm not going to slip up. <laughs> you don't want he to. He said Karl Marx earlier. All right, come on. Okay. I said Groucho. Come he on. said Karl. Right, Harpo. <laughs> that would be good. I would like to see that happen. Um, you guys, of course. TV veterans, and, and you know, I, I want to know what it was like walking down the streets in Toronto. Did, did you and Charlie Hunnam get stopped? And I mean, I can't even imagine, did you get stopped a lot? I mean, people know you guys, so what's it like to be recognized from these great shows that you are both on? Why don't you start? Um, um, Sons of Anarchy has been a game changer for me. It's just a show that really, really resonates with the biggest audience I've ever touched. Um, and. Um, the, the, the enthusiasm is off the board. I mean, people really want to shout out everywhere I go, and it's, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. And is it now in your contract you have to do stuff with Charlie and him all the time? Yeah. Good. Keep it up. It's a good partner. <laughs> he is a good And you, I mean, your show is freaking awesome. I, Thank you. Really, it, I, my son is just freaking that I'm here talking to both of you. You know, what's it like for you to kind of walk down the street and... I love it. It's my, it, that show is, is my baby and my pride and joy, and I love how much people enjoy it, and we work so hard to, to make it as good as we can that the, the greatest feeling is someone coming up and saying that they love it and that it brings them joy, so that's why we do it. 